uh, I'd like to call this meeting to order. And at first, I would like to read a statement due to the COVID crisis. As chair of the Mascoma Valley Regional School District School Board, I find that due to the state of emergency declared by the governor as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, and in accordance with the governor's emergency order number 12, pursuant to executive order 2020-04, members of this public body are authorized to meet electronically. The physical location of this meeting is at the Mascoma Valley Regional High School. However, in accordance with the emergency order, I am confirming that we are providing additional public access to the meeting by telephone and Zoom. All members of the board have the ability to communicate con con contemporaneously sorry, during this meeting through this platform and the public has access to the contemporary listen and if necessary, participate in this meeting by clicking the link to the Zoom meeting. ID number 863-9375-0818 or by dialing the following phone number 1929-436-2866. We previously gave notice to this public of to the public of the necessary information for accessing the meeting using Zoom or telephonically and via the meeting notice. Instructions have also been provided on the website of the Mascoma Valley Regional School District. I will now do a roll call vote of the board um, so we know who is attending in person and who is via Zoom so the public is aware. Uh, I have first Kathleen Stacy is here in the high school auditorium. Uh, I have Danielle Thompson in the high school auditorium along with myself, Cookie Hebert. So the following that I call their names will tell us why they are not attending in person and if they are and where they are and if they're alone and in a closed room and so forth. So we know. So Hope's drag now. Excuse me. I'm Hope Strachnell. I am in Chicago, uh, Illinois. I am uh, not attending due to reasons of COVID-19, and I am in a separate room all by myself. Okay, thank you, Hope. Tim Josephson? Uh, yes, due to COVID-19, I am attending remotely. I'm in Canaan, New Hampshire. I'm alone in the room. My family is in the house. Thank you. Bridget Labrie? Uh, due to COVID, I am home in Enfield attending and I am alone. Thank you. Bruce to go. You get on mute. Uh, how are we doing here? Good. Can you hear me there? Yes. Okay. I'm not attending because of COVID 19 and I'm home at home. Thank you, Bruce. Okay, so at this time, I'd like to have everyone stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, first on the agenda will be the approval of the minutes, both public and non-public from November 24th of 2020. I'll make a motion. Make, oh, go ahead, go ahead, Tim. Okay, I make a motion that we approve the minutes uh, as presented for public and non-public from November 20th. And I'll second that. Tim Josephson for the motion and Daniel Thompson for the second. And do we have any corrections or comments? I think Kathleen Stacey has one. There's a correction on the approval of our minutes from November 10th. Uh, on page six, it shouldn't even have Kathleen Stacy there. I didn't make the motion. The original error was that it said Kathleen Thompson. Thank you. Um, so Kathleen, just to clarify, um, the piece that you showed me was on page two of the public meeting minutes. Uh, 
and it said Kathleen Stacy mentioned in the correction of the minutes from October 27th, it should list on page six, her name is Kathleen Stacy. So the point of clarification, I believe that Kathleen is trying to make is number one, she didn't initially make the motion, it was Daniel Thompson. So it should not even have Kathleen Stacy anywhere near that motion. Correct? Okay. We good, Camilla? Okay. Hey, Cookie. Okay. Cookie? Yes. Oh. Can, I, can I just make a mention? Oh. It me. Can I just make a mention while we're at it? Because being on this side of things, when other people are not muted, it makes it really hard to hear. So if everyone can just double check to make sure that when you're not speaking, you mute. Okay. Uh, Brewster, you need to mute. Okay. Uh, Hope? Um, um, yeah, I don't have the line numbers, but under um, sports update section, uh, after where it says Daniel mentioned, but before where it says Amanda stated, um, I um, pointed out that um, the guidance, the uh, sports plan was relying on guidance that was currently not available on either the NHDHHS or NHIAA website and just made that point. And Amanda, that was the context to her uh, was in that context. So that's it. So just adding that. Okay, thank you. Any other corrections or comments on the meeting minutes, both public and non-public, of uh, November 27th? Okay. Seeing none, do a roll call vote. Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Hope Stragnell. Yes. Bridget Libri. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Daniel Thompson? Yes. Rooster Gove? Rooster? Y yes, did it go through? Uh, we got it now, thank you. Here, you. here we go. Hold on with me, so I'm, I keep. And, and cooking, but yes, the motion passes. Minutes are approved. Okay, well, right now we'll move on to the COVID-19 regional update with Dr. Buffet. Thank you. Hi, Dr. Buffet. There we go. Can you hear me? Good. Um, the usual table that I've been presenting should be in your packet. Um, and are notable for two school district there's school related cases um, in the past two weeks in our district. Um, one just uh, um, over the weekend and yesterday, um, the, uh, there continue to be uh, small numbers of cases in all of our district towns. Um, there's a little bit of a jump in one, one town, Canaan right now. Uh, we'll have to see what that does in the next uh, um, few days. Um, and uh, um, there have been a few um, cases in competing um, schools. The numbers in the uh, community are uh, progressively and concerningly increasing both in absolute numbers and in case rates. Um, and uh, there is, as we all know, I think uh, a uh, long-term care facility cluster now with over 70 cases um, of which one of the uh, mass coma uh, district cases has uh, some um, uh, connection I understand um, the but overall still a relatively uh, small number of school related uh, cases and I think we're uh, you know in in the eye of a, of a building storm um, and uh, hopefully um, we won't see what everybody's expecting, which is a um, 
fairly significant increase as a result of uh, um, holiday travel for Thanksgiving. And uh, um, we'll, we're just gonna have to see what those numbers do here locally. Um, it's, it's a little bit too early to know for sure. Questions? It doesn't look like there's any at this time, Dr. Buffet, but uh, will you be staying with okay. us? I will. I, I was going to uh, um, uh, ask Amanda to uh, um, relate to what the uh, uh, response has been um, to the uh, school related cases in, in the two schools involved. Um, sure, I'd be happy to do that. Um, we have had very we have been very, very lucky, if you will, that we had limited, or I shouldn't maybe say lucky, maybe I should say cautious. And our plan to keep kids and adults safe has worked. We are very, very careful to limit contact time to make sure that there's mask usage, um, to make sure we're maintaining a six foot distance from one another. So I would say you are correct, Dr. Buffet. We believe that there is a connection between the case that I reported today to the public and the case in the local um, uh, care facility. Um, and then we are not really sure last week's case, we're unable to really figure out or pinpoint where that person may have picked it up. I can safely say that neither of those cases um, is attributed to travel for the Thanksgiving break, which is very excellent. I feel that the parents and the staff that reported they would travel have followed the quarantine process. Um, and we are hoping that that same holds true over the holiday break. Um, I am starting to see that people um, in the district and teachers, parents are getting more and more concerned. Um, and I think it would be worthwhile if the board, along with maybe your medical opinion, would think about what does um, extending our holiday break, maybe using the 21st and the 22nd, as remote learning days that would put kids out of our buildings for a full week that would allow us to do some more deep cleaning. It would give people a chance to quarantine if necessary. Um, so I think that is something that we need to sort of discuss and think about if we wanted to move to remote instruction for those two days or if we want to keep those as in-person learning days. But I, I do see that there is quite a bit of concern among the public, among our staff over you know the in-person school and the potential for um, spread of COVID. I would I would think that there's a, um, a good argument to be made for that sort of uh, um, response. Um, and and uh, um, so far we haven't had to do any extended closures of uh, of of the schools for for cases you know clusters of cases as yet. Um, but uh, um, that uh, I think uh, doing it in a planned way rather than an unplanned absence uh, um, mechanism might might actually be be certainly uh, uh, worthwhile to consider um, if the board is um, in accordance. Yes, Dr. Buffet, I think uh, when Amanda gives her superintendent's report a little further down the agenda, I would like to discuss that a little bit further with the board. I appreciate your comments. Thank you. All right, well, I'll, I'll stay on. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so at this time, I'll open it up to public comment. Um, let me see if anyone has anything to say, use your wave or do the hand thing. We do not have anyone here in the auditorium at this time. I apologize if I miss someone. I just trying to be thorough. I do not see anyone. No. Okay. All right. We'll move on with our continuing business. Uh, oh, maybe I'm maybe I'm mixing up meetings, but. Do you, um, does, for the minutes, do you need uh, those attending to identify themselves? Uh, if we, if Kamala cannot uh, get the information from the name uh, she normally would ask. So Kamala, at this time, is there anyone that we need to ask to identify themselves for the meeting? 
because they're not actually in the physical room with you, I don't have to identify them for the minutes unless they speak and participate in the meeting themselves. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, so we're moving on to student representative report. Hello. I guess it's my time to shine. It is. <laughs> um, so I did ask a couple of students like what they, if there's like any concerns or anything. And I did get a question like what happens about snow days? Because yes, we are like, we have the options to be remote, but we're kind of still like wondering what happens if like one morning a bunch of buses can't make it to school. Will they just like zoom in or whatever? Or what is going to be happening there? Um, so I don't know if we have like an answer or anything, but we do. We do. Okay. Um, also, uh, there's kids registering to drive their snowmobiles into school, which is exciting. They always enjoy doing that every year. We have Penny Wars going on right now. For people that don't know what that is, it's this competition between the four grades. And the goal is to have the most amount of pennies like over the grades, but all our grades can like sabotage you and put like dollar bills and like different kind of coins in. And that's all to raise money for like a charity or whatever. And all the money gets donated anyway, but it's still fun. <laughs> uh, and that gets winter carnival points. So that's always interesting because winter carnival is a big thing. Um, we're still having dress up days, which is exciting to see that we can still like incorporate dress up days, even though there are social distance and everything. It was tie dye day, like two weeks ago or this past week. And then pajama day is Friday. So I know a bunch, of, I've been hearing kids talk about that. Um, a lot of learning is happening since the quarter ends next month. So teachers are starting to make sure that they get everything that they need in and you can kind of feel the pressure, but it's been pretty good. I haven't really heard of anyone traveling or like have travel plans for holiday break, which is good to hear. I think most people that I've heard, like even for Thanksgiving, like they were going to go out to family, but they ended up not, which was good. Yeah, I feel like we're doing pretty good. Basketball started, um, I think it was last week or the week before. And so they're doing their social distancing workouts and stuff. Uh, I think cheerleading is also practicing in the gym. So that's exciting. And wrestling, I'm not quite sure what the whole entire point is there. I don't know. Haven't heard anything. I know it's like happening, but I don't know what they're doing. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Oh, and one more thing I remembered. Uh, Project Grad is coming up with ideas for things to do like for fundraisers. So keep your eye out. You know, you always want to help. I know Danielle, she's thinking of things over there, I can tell. See that look. <laughs> but other than that, I think we're, we're doing good at the high school at least. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? Okay. Yes. How are you doing with your wreath, uh, Christmas wreath sales? Oh, we did, I'm pretty sure we did really well. I know that we either sold all of our, I think we sold all of our wreaths and I know that we definitely sold all of our points out of it. There was a good turnout. I was there for the handing out of the poinsettias and lots of different families bought stuff. So that was really good. We got kids to help us kind of hand out things. So it wasn't just the parents. So it was good. Yeah. Yeah, it, it ended up being a drive-through pickups for the students and families to uh, bring back their, their orders. And we just about, uh, we had to extend, we had to call back both the vendors for the wreaths and the poinsettias because there was such a strong community response. So that was, that was great. Well, thank you. I also tried to 
see if I could wear tie dye, if I could give the senior class some extra points. And Deb Davis told me no, I wasn't allowed. <laughs> we appreciate <laughs> maybe, it. Maybe I can get away with the pajama day thing though. <laughs> Oh, gosh, thanks. That was a great report. And I'm sure uh, the superintendent will probably maybe give you a little feedback on those snow days and in her report, if you're staying. So can you can you stay? It's only a couple more on the agenda. Yeah, okay. I won't know now. So. <laughs> All right. So moving on finance and facilities. Um, the finance and facilities met on December the 2nd. And um, the only one that wasn't at our meeting was Hope. Um, Hope was away. Uh, so we had uh, an in-depth report uh, from Corrado, as usual. Um, he addressed the potholes at CES, which has been greatly appreciated more and more every day I drive over them. <laughs> um, there were um, discussion on the snow plowing, where buses should be parked in the upper parking lot, the lower parking lot. Um, so that way there it can all get cleaned up with once the contractor is here. Um, Deb was going to follow up with Butler Bus in regards to that situation. Uh, Corrado also said they had been working on the water treatment procedures maintenance for the pellet boilers. He explains this has to be addressed once a month and that the company has been coming once a quarter for maintenance. His staff will not perform monthly maintenance. Corrado has also been working with Deb to prioritize the district-wide uh, projects. He also has been working in depth with the capital improvement plan with Deb, and that correlates with the warrant articles we we're looking at uh, for tonight uh, for funding. Garrett will say they had just completed cleaning and videotaping of the high school sewer lines. Uh, and that's one of the projects in the capital improvement plan that he is going to be tackling uh, for the, this come, next year. Um, he, re he re Corrado also said one of the goals of facility maintenance is keeping up with the cleaning and the disinfecting of the schools to keep COVID out of the schools so the kids can be in school. And he was very adamant about that. And I appreciate that. Uh, and I know the custodial staff is going above and beyond to make sure that this is happening every day. Corrado reviewed the disinfecting process where there was a COVID positive case of COVID in the building. So he detailed uh, how they start and the procedure and how long it takes to actually do a thorough cleaning and a disinfecting of that particular area or the school itself. Uh, discussion about the boiler use and that the pellet boilers are in use with the backup of oil. Uh, Corrado also explained there are moving variables with the pellet boilers and that they can be finicky with a with all the moving parts and the precision of them. Um, let's see, uh, Deb stated that EVS and CES are an auto delivery for fuel oil and that the high school is out in request and that she said IRS doesn't, the high school and IRS are not using much oil. Uh, so uh, I touched base on the CIP, Deb had handed out uh, a current report for us which I believe we have another one in, this, in the package tonight, which I believe is the same one. Uh, we went through a few different uh, questions of regards to CIP. Uh, we also discussed the long range facilities plan and we didn't know if the long range plan fund could be uh, discontinued and the, that 15,000 that's in there put into facilities or major systems. Um, we have got to look into the details of what that uh, long range plan fund was set up for the language. Uh, audit, Deb said she had everything they need and should hear from them by the end of February. But I think Deb will have an update in her report tonight in regards to the audit. Budget, uh, Monday's budget meeting is a joint meeting with the board, uh, has not changed the budget and a couple more retirements has been submitted. And the current, uh, she said the current SPED budget has 700,000 unencumbered unspent and the regular budget has 2.8 million. Uh, Deb says she's looking at the COVID expenditures to reclassify to the gopher funds in a discussion about special education and that next year's budget is going to be tight. Cafe services, they're doing really well. She said October showed 5,000 more in revenue than expenditures and we should be good as long as the kids, hopefully kids see in school. Uh, the discussion was made of no deliveries over the holiday break. Amanda said she would address the food insecurity in her report to the school board discuss friends and mess going and making deliveries to those in need and sharing that information with the community. 
suggested Camelot to post on Facebook and Bruce has suggested the electronic message board at the high school for that information. As far as transportation, there have been extra transportation costs due into the Hartford and food deliveries with Gopher covering some of this discussion still needing of bus drivers. Driver's Ed, Deb says there is currently a $3,500 loss and that the Gopher Cares can't replace lost revenue. She said this is due only to one student allowed in a car at the time, which is more costly. Deb said she will be able to use some of the funds for COVID funds for additional costs. Uh, the manifests are here tonight. I'm gonna to be signing most of that tonight. We did not have any policies. And also Deb mentioned that she created the warrant articles, which will be included in the school board packet for tonight. It is on our agenda. Uh, and also we, uh, Deb explained the change of the unassigned fund balance, retention of funds being increased for up to 5%. We are currently at up to 2.5%. And she was gonna be sending this to the attorney for that warrant article to be voted on uh, for the exact wording needed. Uh, and that's it. Our next meeting is January the 6th here at the high school auditorium at one o'clock. Any questions? No? Okay. Thank you. Communications committee report. So we had our meeting. Um, when was it? Seems like so long ago, yet it was only less than a week on December 3rd. Um, the main, uh, we talked a lot about um, a lot of the work that has been happening uh, behind the scenes to start building out school messenger for both the email platform, uh, starting up the text messaging options uh, and for the website. Uh, so that will continue and uh, we'll look to have uh, regular updates uh, at our at our next meetings uh, but that's moving forward as we had hoped and planned we'll also look at some google analytics data starting uh, in the next year um, we'll, we'll see where people are going on our website and make sure that we're addressing the things that people are actually looking for there's a policy about school district social media websites and regulations that is under review. And once that um, has made it out of committee, you'll see that here at the board, uh, probably in January. And then we, we did uh, table the communication strategy um, to the next meeting um, to allow us to do a little bit more uh, background work as far as the current modes and methods and tactics um, that we're using throughout the district um, so that we could uh, have that information handy. Um, we did talk about some specific things like making sure that, um, that parents know how to help their students with the Chromebooks for remote learning, especially when it happens at the last minute um, due to uh, a COVID remote learning pivot. Um, we talked about the deliberative session uh, coming up in early February. And then also uh, about the district YouTube channel and setting up some, uh, some protocols for when that should be used essentially anytime there's something that's going out to the public from, uh, from someone within the district um, for official purposes. So our next meeting will be on Thursday, February 4th. And does anyone have any questions? I just wanted to add one more thing, Danielle, um, <laughs> specifically about deliberative. I reached out to Barrett, uh, Christina at the New Hampshire School Boards Association. And uh, he said, yes, they're developing um, some guidelines for deliberative sessions, towns meetings, et cetera. But he'd be happy to, to zoom in to one of our school board meetings and give a little talk and answer any questions that we had um he'd be happy to do that just just talk to him and, and read but it sounds like they had a uh, program last week that touched a little bit on it and they're going to repeat it again in january um but they're working on some more stuff too so uh i would i would love to have barrett here you know either you know later this month or early january or something like that just to give a little 10 minute answer any questions we have and, and logistics and things like that and i think that was the one that i attended last week 
but do we all receive did everyone get the materials from that right okay yeah yeah i know that there was some question as to um the kind of the annual report or the annual meeting side of that as opposed to necessarily the sb2 deliberative session protocols and how that might be impacted by uh by covid and um wanting to make sure that people were uh, still able to participate in the way that they are meant to um but doing so in a way that's safe when for example we can't really be outside under a tent uh, you know, on the football field, uh, we, you know, on February 6th, that's probably not something that's that's realistically going to happen or be very convenient. Although maybe it means that we won't have a lot of conversation. I don't know, but uh, it doesn't sound like it would be the best option. So um, I agree it would be, uh, it, it, it would be of interest, I think, to have Barrett um, perhaps give us a, a, an update on what some of those options would be um, just so that we're not um, tr trying to convey that information to the public at the last minute. Uh, and so I'd say if there's a way for us to have that conversation before the budget hearing in January, that would be ideal because then we'd be able to share that information out with the public at the budget hearing if there's going to be um, you know, a really different way that we're conducting business uh, during the deliberative session. So that's just a suggestion. Yeah, and I think especially if they lean it all towards what they are talking about for an annual meeting with having basically two notifications that have to go out about seven days apart to the public, we just wanna give ourselves plenty of time in case we have to follow that same type of deal. Okay, so is it January 13th? January 13th is the hearing, public hearing for the budget, which means we would have to meet on December 22nd. No? Well, what I'm saying is uh, they just, just the meeting notices, are you saying that we would have to change anything if we met with Barrett Christine on the 12th? Is that too late? I don't necessarily think it's too late, but if the if the budget hearing is happening on what was it, the twelfth or the thirteenth? The thirteenth. Um, I think we have a school board meeting on the twelfth, and we decided that school board meeting that we were going to change the way that the deliberative session was being structured. We could probably give that information on the thirteenth at the budget hearing. Okay. Uh, right. Right. So anything where I think we're talking about deliberative, I would want to make sure that Bonnie was invited to our school board meeting, um, to the meeting to hear the information from Barry. And she may also have other information from her being a moderator. I am sure that they are wrapping around this. So I would just want to make sure we invited Bonnie to that mm -hmm. also. Yeah. Okay. All right, so th so that's uh, is that something that you would reach out, uh, Amanda, to Barrett, Christina, and um, and just make sure that uh, you reach out to Bonnie as well, and um, and if there's any issue or conflict of any sort, you could just uh, get back to us. Okay. Um, Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Danielle. Any more questions for Danielle? Okay. See now we'll move on to Amanda. Uh, the superintendent's report. My written report has been provided in the packet. I talk about two major things there. So I do talk a little bit about families who may need assistance with food over the holiday break, knowing that our students will be home. Um, we will not be able to deliver food over break. So if, if families are in need, we have encouraged them, and I do still encourage them, to reach out to their child's school. We have put out information regarding Friends of Mascoma and having families sign up for their holiday boxes, but that all needs to happen fairly soon. Um, there, there is a fair amount of planning and preparation that goes into creating those boxes. So it's not something we could wait for parents on the 22nd to say, by the way, I need some help with food. So if there are families out there who are struggling and would need some assistance, we are happy to do that. They just need to contact their child's school. We have various programs. Listen is now putting out a program, Friends of Mascoma, 
you know, their food pantry. There are multiple programs available. We just need to know who the people are. And I do believe that both our social workers, Caroline Christie and Cynthia Kalia, are reaching out to families. But if there is anyone out there, please encourage them to reach out to their school. Uh, school counselors are also instrumental in providing um, these services to our families. Um, and then, yay, Isabel, I talked about the snow days. So we have reached an agreement um, with both the Mascoma uh, Support Staff Union and the Mascoma Teachers Union. And snow days will look a little bit different this year. There are two versions. So if there is a pending storm, it's predicted. I know um, on a Thursday that Friday we're gonna get a foot of snow or foot, a couple inches of ice or whatever it may be. The intention is to call a remote day the day before. This will give teachers, students enough time to adequately pack up the materials they would need and to prepare, prepare for a remote day. Those remote days do not need to be made up in June. Currently, we are scheduled to end school on June 16th. If I call five snow days, you're starting to look at the last full week of June gets pretty late. So the ability to use some of those prepared snow days as remote learning days is going to be key to making sure we're out before the 4th of July. Now, that being said, if there is a surprise storm or road conditions are very treacherous at five o'clock in the morning, yay, the joy of a snow day will return and I will call a true snow day. So if it's an emergency situation like that, everybody can relish in the snow, shovel for their mom and dad and help out their neighbors. Otherwise we will prepare and we will switch those you know, snow days to remote learning days. But I do intend to call those days fairly early, get that notice out so students and teachers have ample time to prepare. So there you go is some good news and some better news. Also at this time, I would like to also discuss with the board in regards to our previous discussion regarding the last two days of school, which is December 21st and December 22nd, um, and calling those as remote days. So then we would truly end on the Friday before. Um, I, w I have a couple of things that I just wanted to share that I felt, number one, the custodial staff has gone above and beyond. Corrado, everyone has done their part to make sure that <clears throat> everyone has been able to stay in school. The second part is, is, is supposed to be a, a joyous time of year, kids and Christmas, and I don't want to send them out, you know, all stressed out. If they can start their vacation on that Friday and we can wave at buses and say bye, we'll see you in two weeks. Um, I think that send off would be much better. And then that way there the staff will be able to work those days that no one will be here with the anticipation of them being able to get maybe things done quicker for them as well to enjoy the holiday. Um, I also wanted to ask the board that if you were uncomfortable with making that decision tonight, we're going to remote, that I would like to leave it up to the discretion of the superintendent to do that. I think it'd be all, all fairness to Amanda that she would know the situations that are coming up into, you know, the ending of this this time period for us here that she would be able to make that decision and wouldn't have to come back and ask the board to do so. Um, that was just, that's just my two cents worth. Um, I, I wanna hear from obviously the rest of the board, but I just wanted to put that out there. Cookie, are you looking for a motion to support that? Yes, Tim, in, in okay. some way, shape, or form. I just want to get the consensus of the board to figure out, and then we can discuss further. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a motion for discussion's sake. I'll make a motion that uh, school go remote on December 21st and 22nd. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll second. Tim Josephson has made the motion to go remote on the 21st and the 22nd of December, 2020. Kathleen Stacy has seconded that motion. Is there any discussion? Bridget, did you? 
Yeah, I, I'm just curious, um, Amanda, you had mentioned just doing this, I mean, uh, yes, to allow people to have time, but you'd also mentioned like quarantining and isolating. So I'm curious on the other end too, right? So if I'm looking at, let's say they travel for Christmas and then they come back that weekend and right now we're coming back, I think it's the fifth. Um, you know, what happens on the other end? Does that give, is that quite enough time? You know, so I'm just wondering, like, do we want it on this end or do we want it on this end or do we chuck a day on both ends? I don't know. You know, like, I'm just, I'm curious if what your thoughts are or if we sure. feel like it's fine. Oh, sure, Bridget. So the, the form that we filled out for people to determine whether or not they would be traveling, I only have about five people that, five families um, that have reported that they would be traveling during the holiday break. So they would need to quarantine for the 10 days. And most of them are coming back after the 25th of December. So that gives, you know, that doesn't make for a very long quarantine. You know, it's close. They would miss very few days of school. That being said, I'm not sure, you know, what we're even going to look like as far as COVID in the schools. Um, you know, every day is a gift that we're in the, in the buildings. So um, yeah, right now, Bridget, I don't see a lot of need to provide that quarantine time at the end, just we, because we had a lot of families make the conscious decision and effort to stay in town and stay home. But it could all change, Bridget, I'll, I'll be honest. Thank you for thinking of it. So I, I wanted to support what Bridget was saying is, uh, is uh, adding like two more days on the other end. Because um, even though we had five, only five responses saying that they were going to be traveling, I, I, I don't believe that for a second that that's the total number of people. Um, and so, you know, just because just that's what happens. Um, you know, because like for Thanksgiving, I know people went out and traveled and they sent their kids to school. So, you know, it's, it's, it's a tough decision. So I, I would be happy adding on two, two remote days. I mean, we can, we can leave it up in the air and, and decide that closer to the time. Uh, or give Amanda the authority to do so. But that's, you know, I, I think for quarantine's sake and for safety's sake, just to cover everybody, you know, give everyone that window, give everyone that breather um, to just come back remote and ease back in, um, just just to be safe. Okay, uh, so <clears throat> basically what you wanna do now is you wanna add two more days to the end at this time. Um, it's not that I don't agree with that. I just would like to leave it at the discretion of the superintendent. I would much rather have Amanda do that. And I don't know if that's, if it's easier for us to do something now, or if it is just as easy for her to call those days during the break. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure how that would work. So I think, I mean, I think we can, we can go ahead and say, you know, the 21st and 22nd are good to go remote. It kind of gives everyone a breather and, and they can maybe get some of their family stuff out of the way early. You know, if you're going to go see grandma, you can, you, maybe you want to go see them on Wednesday instead of I don't know, whatever, but um, you know, cause we're going to have a meeting on the 22nd too. And so things will be different. We can make that determination at that time. Um, but I would really also like to say that, that we, we should probably uh, think about a, a strong, I don't want to say strongly worded, but a, a a firm letter saying, please, please, you know, if you are traveling, please quarantine, please, you know, and and figure out a remote option if if kids are going to be quarantined or, you know, just just something coming home from the school district saying like you don't have to tell us, but just please do the right thing. And I I'd like to say it goes beyond um, even just sending a letter home, you know, like maybe it's, we use our social media and the news section on the website, you mm -hmm. know, even if it's just for X amount of time, just to help get the word out there so that people see it, stumble upon it, get sent to them, all the good things. Um, I mean, yeah, and I'm totally game to leave it up to the discretion of Amanda as well, because I think she, she hears <coughs> way more than she would love at times. Okay, so my feeling is that I second the motion because I want to see the support of the school board for remote days on the beginning of the vacation. 
And part of the consideration needs to be focused on those families with the food insecurity because we, the sooner we make a decision which way we're going to move, the better it is for that situation. But I also support the superintendent being the final decision on calling which days are going to be remote. Um, thank you to the board for trusting my discretion. Um, and to address that, Kathleen, we have talked, Deb and I talked about what it could look like to provide food still for families on those two days. Um, I would also say that while I appreciate the discretion of the board, if you did want two days tacked on to the end of January, to the end of, or two into January, we should probably make that decision sooner rather than later. I don't know as I would be able to make that choice like during break, but in counting days, if I look at us coming back on January 4th and 5th remote, and looking at say people did um, travel uh, for the 25th and they came back on the 28th. If we open school on the 6th for in-person learning again, that's the 10th day, right? So the 25th then is a Friday, the 26th of December is a Saturday, the 27th is a Sunday. If people returned home on that Sunday from travel and then were in their homes from the 28th, um, starting on the 28th, that would put 10 days, the 10th day on the 6th. So we've hit about a 10 day quarantine if you added two days onto the end. Um, maybe Dr. Buffet would be able to speak and um, give his opinion medically on this issue. You're muted, Dr. Buffet. You gotta unmute. Uh, got it now, I think. Um, the, as you know, the, the CDC has uh, recently um, reduced the uh, recommendation uh, of quarantine to, to 10 days or some discussion of whether that might even go to seven days with a test. Uh, although the timing uh, uh, for return of testing is uh, slower than we would like. Um, it does make sense to me that if we're going to um, go remote those last two days before vacation, that um, the, the actual at-risk period for exposures is at the end when people are coming back from being away, um, uh, if they've been traveling. So it's, it makes sense to me um, to, to plan, just go ahead and plan to do that. Um, including the planning for, uh, for, for food security for those families that need it um, and, and just be able to, to, uh, um, to give that uh, recommendation um, to our families uh, so that they can plan accordingly. Okay, thank you. So, oh, Danielle, Go ahead. sorry. Um, so, my, my biggest question is whether or not these two potentially four days that we're talking about uh, switching to remote learning would fall under the five that we have in the MOU with staff. And if so, that only leaves one potential swap of a snow day to a remote learning day. Um, and so is that really what we want? Um, so that's one of the questions that I have. The second would be, have we considered making any of those days more like snow days where they are not, uh, they're not an instructional day? Um, again, just thinking about timing and the pre, I guess the pre-vacation uh, crazies that can happen in classrooms um, and, and that sort of thing. Is there any, is there, would there be any benefit to, uh, to just calling it a day off as opposed to a remote learning day um, for any of those things? It would have the same impact of um, lengthening the school year. So it's obviously something that, that would need to be, uh, you know, need to be 
thought of um, and, and discussed. Um, but we're essentially going to end, unless we don't have very many snow days, um, we're going to end up extending the year if we move to potentially four days to remote uh, and have to do snow day, snow days um, as we move through the winter. So I'm just asking the question uh, to see if there's any preference or if there's any, um, you know, what, what the difference would be in calling it a day off versus a remote learning day. Um, and then thirdly, um, we talked last time about kind of that matrix of extracurricular activities and if it was a remote day due to staffing shortages or, or in this case, this would be a proactive remote learning pivot as opposed to a COVID case pivot. And would that mean that our activities um, would also not be in session? So just kind of the, the domino effect of each of, um, of each of these decisions. I wanna make sure that we're, um, we're keeping all that in mind. Can I, can I throw one more domino effect on there? Um, and I'm not you know, saying one thing or the other, but just to keep in mind that this also has an effect on those parents who do have to go to work and their kids would be at school. So, I mean, I'm, you know, we, I know we're trying to make this decision as soon as possible kind of thing, but it, it'll affect them on both ends, right? Whether they have to return to work and employers are definitely still being pretty great about it, but that's, I'm just saying, as long as we're keeping that in mind, because it's easy for us to say, do remote, but for those with younger kids anyways, who are, you know, need more assistance, that does make it harder on them on that side of things. So just keeping that in the back of our minds as well. Um, I'm having a hard time understanding the two days before vacation um, in terms of how that is helping, you know, with transmission, uh, lessening the, the, you know, I can see that I could see the value of adding it at the end. Um, and so I might just not be catching on to something here, but, but so uh, the value at the end to me is that there's more time to isolate before people come back. And that's when people are potentially more infected from travel. So I might be missing something here. So Hope, yep, I think there is not a whole ton of lessening of the transmission for in the schools. However, I do see that there is a benefit in um, helping families who are, you know, maybe tied to the school, like our teaching staff, um, and enabling them to kind of decompress, take a few days to like uh, not be so stressed out. Am I seeing our teachers are working really, really hard? And I know everybody is, but yes, our teachers are working very, very hard. Uh, a remote day or two where the uh, before the break would be extremely appreciated and helpful, I believe, for them. Um, do I think it may help also in just kind of keeping the kids out of school so that the custodial staff can get that that thorough cleaning taken care of? Yes, I do also think that that could be helpful there. Um, but as I'm starting to see, uh, I think maybe we should, Cookie, I think I am not comfortable moving forward with this without the support of the board. I do think um, if the board wanted me to put out a form to parents, uh, I could do that and we could see what we got for results there. Um, I do know that these would be days. I, I will say that another local school district did the same thing the two days before Thanksgiving. But instead of using them as remote days, just gave them to the teachers and the, the kids as days off. Danielle is correct. Those days would have to be made up. Um, but that is also another option. I do not think that they would be part of the snow day MOA because it's not like an emergency snow day. These would be planned remote days. And um, as far as extracurricular activities, I do not believe that those would need to be canceled because this is not a COVID related reason that we would be doing that. But yes, Hope, this is more of a gift, if you will, for the staff. Yes, it may put some parents who do rely on us for childcare at a loss, um, but if we were able to tell them now, they may be able to make plans in order to ac accommodate that. 
Well, I guess perhaps then the first two days could be days off, like you were saying, and then the the end would be remote. If if that if it's a stress thing, that might be better. That's all I'm thinking. So. Okay. Um, I want to say something, but I don't think you or not. Um, you you got to make sure that first off, you, am I still in here? I want to make sure that you uh, if you do this. You gotta get well. You gotta get hold of the Butler bus and make sure the buses aren't running that day. That's number one. Uh, and as far as snow days, I don't want to see us using any snow days for any of this, because even if uh, Amanda has to use up to five snow days, it still has the discretion of the uh, the director of uh, education in New Hampshire. Where she can petition if we ever have, have to use up those five days sometimes during this year. So we need to always remember that. I mean, we don't want to use these these days as a as a preference for that. But uh, that's in the food and security which you already brought up, which I'm very concerned about what the kids with, you know, what they need on these holidays. Uh, I can understand why I, I would be in agreement for taking the two days before the uh, the vacation and going ahead and letting them do the remote. And then, and then go by the discretion of the superintendent uh, after the end of the vacation if you need to add on the other two. Uh, that's the only thing I got on that. I just think that uh, that's what I wanted to make sure that we were uh, making sure the logistics so we don't wait too long. Thank you, Brewster. So uh, right now we have a motion on the table for <clears throat> December 21st and 22nd to be remote learning days. Point of order, you're taking a vote before any public comments, not appropriate. Okay. Well, there would be any public comment at this time. This is a board decision. So I apologize, I apologize no, for that. I think it's out of order and you need to consider this as a point of order. You've taken no public comment in this meeting from anybody who pays taxes and you need to consider this as a point of order for working parents and for families in this district. Okay, um, so at this time, the motion that is on the table, um, I think either we're going point to- Point of order, I'm asking for the chair to be overruled. At this time, this is I'm split. asking for the chair to be overruled on this point of order. You've not ruled on the point of order. You need to rule on the point of order. She's not out of order. She's not out of order. I'll go by the by the rules of, of the of the board. Uh, and, whatever okay. you make up, is that what you're saying? Whatever you make up, Rooster. I'll, I'll, I'll get the book out if you want me to. I got the book right Rooster, here. you're not that bright. Let's be honest. Walk um, out that is time. enough. That is enough, uh, Kamala. That's enough. That's enough. You will not be doing that to any member of this board who has been long serving on this board. I'm sorry. That was just uncalled for. Okay, um, so furthermore, uh, Kamala, whatever we get to do to keep that muted, please, because that is definitely not gonna happen again. Okay, so the motion on the table is for the remote learning of the December 21st and 22nd of 2020. Are we going to add the two days to that motion or are we leaving it to the discretion of the superintendent to be able to make that decision? There's been a multitude of questions and good comments in regards to the food insecurities and the planning of parents and working and so on and so forth. So I think maybe we should just get all together on this and decide if it's gonna be just the 21st and 22nd or is it gonna be both those days and January 4th and 5th so that Amanda can plan and make sure that this is gonna happen? So I guess it would be up to Tim and Kathleen if they would like to amend their motion. That's... <laughs> uh, you know, it's... What's the flavor of the board? It's, it's, it's up to, you know, a discussion. It sounded like some people were, some people weren't. So I, I am happy to amend that if, Kathleen, if you want to amend that as well with me uh, to, to have the Monday and Tuesday, the was it the fourth and the fifth? Yes, the fourth and the fifth, uh, Jim. Right. I would, yeah. I would support seconding that 
addition to having the January dates added to the motion. Okay. So the motion as stated, Kamala is going to be to have December 21st and 22nd and January 4th and 5th as remote learning days in regards to um, the vacation, the break. And that was Tim Josephson and Kathleen Stacy. Thank you, Kamala. Any further discussion on this before I do a roll call vote? I just think that it's really important to keep in mind that we are entering a really, you know, everybody, every medical, all the CDC that we're entering a really, um, you know, treacherous phase. So I think whatever we can do to support um, lessening the transmission is a good thing. So I, I'm all for this. Okay, Amanda, you have any other questions for the board or anything? Are you okay with this? I didn't know while people are in. Well, I do, yeah, I do. I do not cookie. Um, I do uh, appreciate the input um, and the input from Dr. Buffet also at this time. All right. Thank you. Did you have any more comments, Brewster? No, you're you, get on mute. Bear with me. I keep trying to make sure I'm on here the right way. I want to make sure we're doing everything, just so you know, we're doing everything by the Robert's Rule of Order. I have the book right here in front of me. So if we ever need this for anything, but I'm ready to go on with what we're doing. So that's all I want to make sure you, you guys know. I do have the book here. And I know we, we are doing everything by proper procedure. Okay. All right. Thank you, Brewster. Okay. So at this time, no further discussion. It'll do a roll call vote. Uh, Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Hope strike now. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Daniel Thompson. I just want to clarify this is so that it is at the discretion of the superintendent. Correct? Or it's straight up four days remote? It was, I, I amended the motion so that it was uh, two days before and two days after. Okay. Yes. Yeah, no, this is going to be two before and two after. Okay, uh, uh, I mean, yes. All right, thank you. And Bruce DeGove. Yes, yes. And Cookie Hebert, yes, so that's seven zero zero. So the motion carries. Um, obviously, Amanda, if she needs any more support from us, December 22nd, we'll be meeting. If there's anything that comes to light beforehand, I'm sure uh, we'll be included in that conversation. I thank you for all of that. Um, anything further on Amanda's report for anyone? Quickly, I, I Bridget? Did. Yes. Uh, Amanda, you said that, so we made this decision, you're collecting information about the food options for people or will be right based off of this decision as well. Absolutely, we have already put out um, information to families, but we can also put out more information. We do um, have the opportunity to provide uh, a pickup lunch and breakfast program at the school those two days if needed. Can we also utilize our uh, news section on the website to post something with both our school options, the FOM options, um, just, you know, just making sure that basically we're, we're putting it out there. So I know we talk about this in communication. So can we do like a social media and, you know, just tie it back to the website if we need to on the news section, just so that it's everywhere for people. Oh yes. We want people to be able to easily access it. Yes, Bridget, definitely. Okay. Anything further for Amanda right there? Okay. Thank you, Amanda. I'm moving on to this uh, business administrator's report, Deb Ford. Thank you, Cookie. So you have the financials um, for November in your board packet. Um, so far, so good. Um, as I discussed previously, I've um, reclassed a lot of expenses into the gopher money. Um, so that is just about completely, um, it's allocated as of December 1st, which opens up the CARES grant for expenditures related to COVID going forward. 
Um, so I'll be working on the budget with um, Nancy Murphy on that grant. Um, you also have in this board packet um, that Martha added today is the draft audit report. So um, I will need a motion to accept that so that um, that the superintendent and the board chair and myself can sign the management representation letter. Um, one thing you will notice um, at the end of the management representation letter before the financial statements of the draft audit is an audit difference. And I wanted to explain what this was. We have a flexible spending account, um, which is a benefit for employees. They contribute through payroll deduction pre-tax, and then they have a debit card that they can use for medical and um, dental expenditures that aren't covered by their insurance. Um, this, um, this account is just a balance sheet account. It's nothing to do with expenditures or revenue for um, the district, except that if people do not spend their money, they, they can only carry over $550 at the end of the fiscal year. And if they don't spend their money, they forfeit it to the district. So currently we have an additional just under $15,000 in that liability account, which um, will ultimately end up being revenue to the district. But um, because of how, I'm trying to explain this easily, how the money works, they, they can use their fall allotment in July. So, and then they contribute through payroll deduction for the year. Um, what happens is at the end of June, they still have 90 days to expend that. So I really don't get a report from Benefit Strategies, the company that manages um, the money until November 1st. So until then, I really haven't been able to reconcile it correctly. And of course this year with COVID, they have till the end of this month to spend last year's money. So you can see it's kind of a moving target. So I do have a plan with um, some help from the auditors with a humongous spreadsheet on how to reconcile what, we're, what our employees are contributing and then what the company is paying out on their behalf. So that, that is the explanation for that. Um, I did tell the auditors that, you know, I've never had anything out of the ordinary on my audit. And he said, it's, he said, it's not material, it's not a big deal, but it is something that I felt needed to be explained. But other than that, the audit is the normal audit that you've seen every year. Um, the management discussion and analysis starts on page seven through 19, and then the actual financials um, start on page 21. So when you have a chance to actually review this in more detail, if you are so inclined, I'd be happy to um, answer any questions you have on this. So I do need a motion to approve it. Okay, I'll entertain a motion. Kathleen Stacey. Uh, first, I have a question regarding that flex spending account. Mm -hmm. That is an optional account for participation by the employees, right? Correct. Okay. And uh, then I would make the motion to go ahead and approve. How do you want it worded for that? Um, Approve the draft, the draft audit presentation. Report, the draft the, audit report. For the audit report. I'll second that. Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion on the table to accept the draft audit report uh, uh, from Kathleen Stacy and Daniel Thompson. Any further discussion from the board? Okay, seeing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Kathleen Stacey. Yes. Hope Stragnow. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Danielle Thompson. Yes. Brewster Gove. Yes. Yes. And, and Cookie Hebert. Yes. So uh, the motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Deb, for that. Okay, and then um, the other thing I have is um, Cookie mentioned in the finance and facilities report um, about the one capital reserve we have that is the long range planning fund for facilities. Um, so I, that, was, that was established in March of 2009 and the definition is of this 
long range planning fund is for the purpose of continuing research and planning for facilities development usage and or renovation expansion or construction so at that time um, fifteen thousand dollars was put into that um, I do have information from Gordon Graham, um, the lawyer that we use for um, all things school board related. Um, so the strategy for capital reserves is rather than change a purpose, dissolve the fund and let the money in the fund lapse into surplus, then appropriate from surplus to a new fund, which is what we do every year anyway. So I wanted. I wanted to share that before we get to the warrant articles, which are later on the agenda. And also the capital improvement plan approval is on later on the agenda as well. And I think that's all I have. Okay, any, any questions for Deb? Okay, seeing none, uh, we'll move on. In educational funding in New Hampshire, Tim? Oh my God, do I have updates. So finally, after uh, an entire year, just about, the Commission to Study Educational Funding in New Hampshire has finished. Uh, they released their final report uh, last week. I spent most of my day today pouring through all 180 pages of it uh, so I could uh, regurgitate it to you here. Um, it, uh, if you're looking for it, it was a, a mailing from the New Hampshire School Board Association. They sent a direct link out to it, uh, I think, on either the first or the second. So go back uh, to your school board email to take a look at that. It is also publicly available uh, on multiple websites. Uh, just look for it. Um, OK, so the biggest the biggest thing that they found, uh, they looked at everything. And I just want to say that they did a really, really thorough job. Um, this is the biggest, uh, most thorough uh, deep dive they've done in a generation. Uh, the last time one was done was either 1982 or 1984, something like that, uh, of this comprehensive uh, nature. And um, I just wanted to point out also that Barbara Tremblay served on this, uh, former superintendent of here at Mascoma. So that was good to have our local perspective, and she certainly knows what school funding is like, especially back in the day. Uh, so that was really nice. To, that was really nice that she she was able to get in there. Um, they started with a with a, a premise of looking at what's the old question, what's the question that that they were previously trying to solve, and the, the question was really, what does it cost to run a school? That was the old question that we were as asking. The question now is, what does it cost to educate a student? So the difference is between like, what does it cost to like run a facility, and what does it cost to actually educate a kid? Uh, so that's good. So they started with the the right question, <laughs> um, and what it came down to. <clears throat> was uh, as i mentioned in previous meetings that that they you know based on their public uh input and listening sessions and all that um you know most of the public understood that there was a problem with school funding in new hampshire uh but nobody wanted any kind of new revenue stream or anything new like they didn't want an income tax they want sales tax all that sort of thing so uh what they what they settled on was recommending that the uh, statewide educational property tax, uh, also known as the SWEPT, uh, which has been in effect, I learned, since 1919, uh, and it started at a rate of three dollars and fifty cents per thousand, uh, and right now it's at a dollar ninety three per thousand. So it's actually gone down uh, in a hundred years. And um, they found a lot of things. They found is that while we are, uh, you know, we do spend some of the most per student. Uh, compared to the rest of the country, uh, compared to the rest of New England, we are behind other states. Um, you know, we are, uh, the, the, the way that New Hampshire funds is extremely uh, repressive and extremely regressive. Uh, I will point out that, um, you know, they, they found a lot of really good things in terms of like what's, what's happening that's, that's going right because our students have educational uh, successes compared to the rest of the country. You know, New Hampshire students always do really well. Um, but there's a lot of room for improvement because when you look, look into it, it's a deep dive and you see just how big the, the um, disparity is between districts. So what they suggested, what, what they, they ran numbers and stuff, and, and what they suggested was using instead of, um, you know, looking at the equality, which is to send, you know, the same amount of money to every single school district across the state, regardless of need, um, but instead to target aid to those based on the most need, 
uh, based on student outcomes, achievements, things like graduation rates, things like test scores, things like um, free and reduced lunch, things like that. So by being able to take statewide property tax uh, and then retarget it to the most to the communities that need it the most, um, you end up with a really uh, a much better funding mechanism. Um, I'm just looking back here. I had one pulled up. Uh, but they so what they rec what they ran numbers and the crazy thing is they found that uh, if you did a statewide property tax where right now is using the existing like uh, you know it costs a total of like two point uh, where is it no I'm sorry like three point six three point five billion dollars total for all uh, education in New Hampshire and they looked at that and said okay if we take all that money and we put it we dump it into you know, one big pot and then split it up for everybody in the whole state. Uh, you'd come out with a statewide property tax uh, for your prop for everybody in the state would have a statewide property tax rate of 1205 per thousand. Um, this would cause an increase in 70 towns and a decrease in property tax in 167 towns. Uh, it, and those numbers based on various formulas go up and down. So you can see that it's a small number of towns would see an increase, a huge number of towns and a huge number of students would see uh, a decrease in property taxes. So they, you know, it's, it's a very interesting, if you're into this thing, I won't bore you with a lot more data on that, um, but it, it, it takes a need blind approach. Uh, right now we have a need blind approach where they just give money based on certain, you know, little triggers. Uh, this would actually turn it upside down because what they really found is something a lot of this is really common sense to us uh <laughs> what they really found was that property poor towns pay more to get less um because your tax rates are higher you get a more money out of people who don't have it and you get less as a result and this is something they found in rural areas and in the cities in manchester and um you know so that is something to look at and they said that you know there are some somehow some places where a, a house with a $300,000 house is paying literally the same dollar amount in taxes as a $3 million house in another town, uh, which is wild. Um, you know, so, so it was a really, really comprehensive uh, look at this. I, I highly encourage you to read it. Uh, it gets really into the nitty gritty, uh, but you know, it, it's, it's very fascinating to see how much stuff they found out and, and, um, you know, they did a lot of really, this is very much a very uh, thorough report. Um, you know, so what I was encouraged by was that they were looking to tie, uh, you know, funding to uh, to test scores, to results like that, but not in the manner of if you have bad results, you're going to get less money. But like, oh, that's the place where they're not achieving as much. They need more targeted aid. So now the ball is in the legislators court, legislature's court to do something with this. Uh, so uh, that's the next step for educational funding in New Hampshire. But this report is a very, very deep dive. Uh, it really points out a lot of things that we up here in Mascoma already knew. Uh, but uh, it's good to see the whole state do it, you know, get to, to see that the whole state sees it. Um, they had hours, like hundreds of hours of, of meetings and everything. Um, and, and a wide variety of people with, with uh, you know, experience and, and such on the commission, you know, from a wide range all over the state. So not just in like the southern part or not just in the western, whatever. It's all over the whole state. And um, yeah, so that's that's that. Um, you know, I'd be happy to if you want to, you know, talk to me more about it one on one. That's just reach out to me. That's fine. Um, but any questions that I can try to answer from anyone on the board? Um, I don't see anyone, Tim. But <laughs> all right. Geez, I mean, we've been waiting all year for that report. Yeah, they got put behind a little bit from COVID. Uh, they had to, you know, it was it was supposed to be their due date was December first, so it was they knew that you know it was it was going to be a long report, but they did a lot of meetings. They did so many, you know, like multiple ones each week, and they have different sections they broke down because they really balanced it between students' needs and taxpayer needs, and how do you balance those two? Um, and really what they came up with was the idea to really uh, target aid. It sounds wild, but that's really what it came down to. Go figure. Um, because New Hampshire spends the least amount of money as a state on their public schools. And it's made largely with local tax dollars at the local level. Now, the funny thing is that we as a state 
spend a really high amount per student, uh, which means that the political willpower is there in your local communities to spend more on your to spend on your schools. But how do we do that at the state level? So that is the question they were seeking to answer. And um, yeah, it's it's really thorough. It's it's really interesting. Um, so I encourage you all to just take a you know an hour or two and just kind of flip through it. I would uh, there's a really good charts and and you know they have made it easy to read where you can go down and see a chart. Uh, you know, see some good data and they have like, you know, recommendation points that you can read at the end and stuff. So, um, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Jim. All right. If there's nothing further, we'll move on. The Aspen Institute Project Play. I think we're just... Yep, we're just in uh, in collection mode for that. Um, they have extended. We're not the only school that has uh, dealt with uh, the crazy situation of kids being in and out of school and all those sorts of things. So uh, they have extended their period of time to the end of the end of the calendar year. Okay, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda is Mascoma Valley Regional High School athletic update. And um, in our packet tonight, we have the optional off season workouts have been successful thus far. Participation numbers are strong with the official tryouts practices beginning on December 14th of 2020. Indoor track and field will not have a regular season meets this, this winter due to the limited availability of the college facilities. The NHIAA will decide if there will be a state championship and what that would look like. I don't believe Rodney is with us tonight, but Todd is here. Hello, Todd. Hi, everyone. Um, IRS is scheduled on schedule, looking to start up practices and clinics next week. Um, last week, NHI did in this week were their skills and drills week. Um, we decided to just start up with the regular practice date of December 12th. Um, and we're going for there. We will be practicing for about a month in a week and then waiting to see, have some games scheduled, and uh, we'll take it day by day, week by week. Great, sounds good. How is the um, the signups going? I mean, do you have your usual uh, amount of kids or? I mean, it's hard to say the, the, the one they've been chomped. I mean, most of the kids asked before soccer was done when basketball starts, so. Um, it's, it's hard to say with the middle school kids, but I, I, I do think um, there are a few, and I've heard a few at the high school that just decided not to play this year because they didn't want to wear masks, which is okay. You know, this is a, a, a special situation, but, um, and, you know, working with a few families that are concerned and, and I've kind of said, well, you know, start coming to some practices and being being around their classmates anyways that they're around every day and just try out the practices and let's wait and see what becomes of of going outside the school which um might not even happen so um we're okay with baby steps this year and and kind of doing what what works best for the families but um want to give them the capability to get in the gym and start sweating and wearing a mask so while doing it so that'll start next week All right, thank you so much, Todd. Any questions for Todd from the board? Okay, thank you again. Uh, moving on, under new business, uh, we're looking at the warrant articles for the 2020 vote. Deb? Um, so you have the warrant articles in your packet. Um, I almost forgot, uh, Martha, realize that we needed a school district clerk as well. So that's one more, why there's one more than I announced at the last meeting. So we thought we should um, have a district clerk. So there's a district clerk, the two members, um, the board members from Canaan Enfield, the budget committee members from Canaan Enfield, and then the operating budget is article four, and the default budget is part of that, as you know. Article five is to fund facilities, capital reserve, um, to fund the capital improvement plan. Um, the accreditation activities is article five. 
And then cafeteria equipment is Article 7. Article 8 is the one I mentioned with the change in the law from school districts being able to retain 2.5% to increase that to 5%. So the wording for that article came from Gordon Graham. So those are the ones we had. And I know Cookie, you had mentioned um, discontinuing the long range planning fund capital reserve. So that would be something we could add if the board um, would like. Okay, so I just wanted to also discuss Article 8 for a second. Um, I believe in our discussion at Finance and Facilities, you had mentioned that when we were retaining the 2.5% initially, that the DOE had a big say in how those were expended. Do we have more flexibility with those funds now? Did They changed um, some of the wording on that, I, I believe, right? Yes, yes, they did. They did change um, quite a bit of the wording on that. So um, that's why it says that you can retain up to 5% of net assessment, which is um, the property taxes raised locally. So the local property tax is your net assessment to allow the expenditure of any amount retained after holding a public hearing um, notice of which is published seven days in advance. So the board could have a public hearing to say that you were gonna spend some part of the amount you retained for a specific um, item that came up that was not budgeted for. And then you would just add this amount to your budget. So it's, it's way more flexible and you wouldn't need to, um, you don't need to have New Hampshire DOE approval and you would just have to report it in the annual report, what you spent it on. So you would still want a good reason, I would think, to spend it. But well, it, does, yeah. it gives us a ton more flexibility because if you look at um, towns, they can retain between five and 17% and the DRA recommends that they retained um, somewhere in the middle of that, at least. So it does give you a little more flexibility. And I really think um, we can budget tighter if you have you know, funds available to you if something happens that you didn't plan for. So I think, um, I think it would, it is, it's a great change in this law that the legislature did this year. Yeah, because I think the initial conversation when we first went to the two and a half percent, it was kind of scary waters because we weren't sure exactly how we could spend that money. And if they said no, and we had a crisis situation going on, you know, we're still stuck. So I think loosening this up for us to be able to do that helps both in our budgeting purposes and to alleviate, you know, catastrophes in some way. So, um, right. And I think, I mean, if you had a public hearing, I mean, we would certainly um, notice the public but also the budget committee, I would think, you know, the budget committee would be involved as well. And absolutely. I just yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, we'll go through um, the articles one by one and I'll um, get them. Do we need to do that tonight? Do we usually do that tonight? It's either that or it'd be the January meeting. Then wouldn't we want it before the public hearing? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so if, if you're okay with that, not unless you want to wait till the December 22nd meeting, the next board meeting, because then we can discuss putting on the long range fund on here. Wait till the 22nd? Are we gonna have the 22nd is the question. Well, that was my next question. <laughs> we normally don't. Historically, we don't, but these are different times. <laughs> Why don't we do it? Why don't we do it when everybody's on tonight? I mean, we know, why wait? Because that way we're all all here. All seven of us are in this thing. Right. So if we did have to add another warrant article in regards to dissolving the long range plan capital reserve, uh, is that doable? Yes. Okay. All right. So if it's okay with the members, I would like to at least get these um, put to bed tonight. And then that way, they, if we have an addition of one, it would be a little easier to deal with. Okay. So article four, which is the operating budget, I will be looking for a motion to approve 
and I will be taking a roll call vote for each one. So do I have a motion to approve Article 4, which is the operating budget for $29,531,828 with a default budget of $29,727. $29,727,735, sorry. I'll make a motion that we uh, approve Article 4 of our warrant for a budget of $29,531,828 with a default budget of $29,727,735. Was that Kathleen? No, nope, it was Danielle. <laughs> oh, okay. You guys keep switching your names. <laughs> um, okay, so do we have any further discussion on the operating budget for Article 4? Okay, seeing none, we'll do a roll call vote. Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Hope Stragnell. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Danielle Thompson. Yes. Bruce Jagove. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Cookie Hebert. Yes. And that's a unanimous uh, in the affirmative. Article five, uh, fund capital res uh, fund facilities capital reserve for the capital improvement plan. And the amount is up to $75,000 to be put into that plan. I'll make a motion that we approve Article 5 to put 75, up to uh, $75,000 in the Facilities Capital Reserve Fund from uh, available fund balance. I'll Do I have a second? I'll second it. <laughs> Thank you. Somebody. Any discussion on the Article 5? OK, seeing none. Roll call vote, Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Hope Strike now. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Bruce Jagove. Yes. Yes. Danielle Thompson. Yes. And Cookie Hebert. Yes. That passes unanimously. Article six, fund accreditation activities, capital reserve for the sum of up to $5,000 to, to be added uh, from uh, surplus undesignated funds. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we uh, appropriate $5,000 to be added to the Accreditation Activities Capital Reserve Fund from uh, unencumbered fund balance on January 1st, or no, July 1st. Second. All right, Kathleen Stacy for the second, Tim Josephson for the motion. Any discussion? All right, we'll take a roll call vote. Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Hope Strag now. Yes, sorry. That's okay. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Daniel Thompson. Yes. Bruce Tegove. No, you. Okay, well, work? Yes. I hope so. Pushing buttons. Is that a yes, Brewster? No. <laughs> you are muted again. Oh. I keep. No. <laughs> I know. Try it again, Brewster. I'll say yes for the third, fourth time. Okay, thank you, Brewster. Cookie Hebert, yes. Motion carries. Article seven, fund cafeteria equipment, capital reserve. Uh, we're looking to appropriate the sum of up to $25,000 for undesignated fund balance. Go ahead, Tim. I'm trying. 
All right. I make a motion that uh, we approve uh, Article 7 to appropriate the sum of $25,000 to the Cafeteria Equipment Capital Reserve Fund uh, from excess fund uh, balance. And I'll second. I tried. <laughs> I tried to do this, but it didn't work. Got it. All right. Any further discussion on the Cafeteria Equipment Fund, Article 7? Okay. Seeing none. Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Drag now. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Danielle Thompson. Yes. Bruce DeGove. Yes. <laughs> and Cookie Hebert. Yes. It passes unanimously. Got that one right. <laughs> Article 8 to increase un unassigned balance retention up to 5.0%. Uh, I'll make a motion that we approve for the warrant Article 8 uh, to adopt the revisions to RSA 198 4-B uh, Roman 2 to allow the district to retain up to 5% of the district's net assessment in any year to allow the expenditure of any amount retained after holding a public hearing, notice of which is published seven days in advance, and to require the school board to include an annual reporting of the retained fund balance in its annual report to the district. A second. Okay. Tim Josephson for the motion, Kathleen Stacy for the second. Do we have any discussion on that? I was curious, Cookie, just because you almost said it that way as well. So I wasn't sure, even though we say up to in the article, do we have to say it in the, the name of it? Or is it, I mean, I know it makes sense to us, but I've noticed you read it that way, where you wanted to add the up to 5%. So I you, did. I did. So in the title, Deborah says Article 8 to increase on us and uh, balance retention to 5%. Are we, I mean, if someone looks at this, they won't know that maybe that we've already done up to the 2.5%. So do we have to put up to 5% in the title? Is that basically what you were looking at, Bridget? Yeah. We could ask legal on their opinion. Yeah, I suppose. Or, and if we have to amend this, we did ask legal. I'm oh. reading. I'm reading Gordon Graham, so that's oh, okay. how. That's exactly how he wrote it. Okay. Up to five percent. So you don't have to. It's just like the two and a half percent. You don't have to retain right. that amount. You can retain right. any amount up to. So that's right. We're talking about the title, which doesn't does yeah. not say up to. It should have up in it. It doesn't have up to in the title of Article to. Eight. It just and I'm, I'm wondering if none of the other to, similar to the other Warren articles if could it just say it does increase unassigned balance retention and take off the two five percent we don't have in the titles of the other Warren articles the amounts there yes Would so in, increase to... unassigned balance retention And that will simplify yeah. it. So once they read the actual warrant, then they will have a better understanding. Okay, I'll good, agree with that. Good point. So uh, Tim and Kathleen, you're okay with that change? I am okay with amending my motion. Okay. Kathleen? Yes, I'm okay with it. Okay. Any further discussion? Thank you, Bridget, for that. Okay, we'll do a roll call vote. Kathleen Stacey? Yes. Hope strike now? Yes. Bridget Libri? Libri? Yes. Uh, Tim Josephson? Yes. Daniel Thompson? Yes. Bruce DeGove? Yes. <laughs> Cookie Hebert? Yes. It passes unanimously. So if there is an addition of Warren Article number nine in regards to the long range plan, uh, I think we should probably make some type of decisions on that tonight in uh, so going along with the explanation that, Dave, uh, that uh, Deb had given to us in regards to that, so we have to put a warrant article to dissolve that account, so then it just gets absorbed into the budget, and then you would expend that. Right, it would just become part of unassigned fund balance, and you're already doing these other warrant articles to use that unassigned fund balance to fund. Okay. So it's just, he said it was cleaner to dissolve it than to change a purpose of a capital reserve account. And that makes sense to me. Yeah, that's what I thought, because that's why I wanted the wording, because it was like 
it could have been quite sticky in regards to trying to get that to be changed. So that was good to know. So what is the board's pleasure with that? Would you like our Warner article number nine in regards to dissolving that account? And the purpose that it came up in discussion in finance and facilities was because of the $15,000 that's been sitting there. You know, we thought it would be best utilized in the facilities account if we could, or to help with the CIP one way or the other. So um, if it goes into the general fund, then it's just gonna be dispersed within all of our capital reserves actually. So I think that'll probably be uh, the best for it. At least, you know, it's money that we can utilize. So. What's what's it's currently uh, designated for? Is it what's the specific hangup? I guess in terms of why we can't just use it for something else that's long range, and just like spend it down. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what we would have for a long range um, expansion or construction projects. Okay. I know I don't have any in mind. <laughs> okay, I just want to make sure that there's nothing we could like you know put it into somewhere else you know, like use it for something else but it sounds like it's pretty um narrow in its scope so yeah, yeah honestly um we we probably should have used it when we were planning you know the high school renovation and addition project that would have made sense but i, I don't think was. i was aware of this at that time right one of the things i'm wondering um we have a new facilities director um who um is just sort of getting his, um, you know, sea legs, so to speak, and now has COVID and probably hasn't had a lot of time to think about, you know, long range plans. Um, can this money be used in terms of, um, for example, if they needed to do some sort of uh, uh, report in terms of, you know, uh, I know we've done some energy, but long term planning, or, you know, perhaps, perhaps something, a, a, a capital improvement plan down the road, but it would actually need to hire some consultants. Um, and is, has Corrado had a chance to kind of weigh in on, does he want that, you know, can that money be used for that? And has he had a chance to weigh in on like, you know, I don't really know now, but I might in a year or two know. Well, this is specifically for long range planning for the purpose of continuing research and planning for facilities development, usage and or renovation, expansion or construction. Um, I, I don't believe that we have anything in our capital improvement plan that this would fall under. It's very specific and the capital reserves are really, they have to be used for the purpose they were intended for. So I, I just don't see anything coming up that we would be doing um, expansions or renovation or construction that this would fall under. I mean, to use $15,000 for planning, it would have to be a substantial project, I think. Right, okay, anyone else? I have a question. Kathleen? So when we dissolve the account, it no longer has a purpose because it's going into the general budget, right? Correct. It's not really going into the general this budget. It, it goes into the unassigned fund balance. We okay. Can't use it in the budget. It goes back into unassigned fund balance, and then mm -hmm. technically, what would happen is this fifteen thousand plus the interest it's earned since two thousand nine would really kind of go to fund the other warrant articles that are for capital reserve. Okay, but do we need to uh, establish a new purpose or not? No. Okay. Thank you. Yep. No. No. Yeah, good, good question. Because I had that same question. I wasn't sure. That's why I asked for the specific wording and for to get guidance on that. Because warrant articles can be very tricky. It's all in the wording, as they say. I learned that the hard way. <laughs> so okay. So the board. Uh, pleasure would be to have Deb draw up Article Nine in resolve to dissolving that uh, specific capital reserve and bring it back to us. Okay, we shall do that. Thank you. Uh, what else do we have? Capital improvement plan. That's still, oh, Deb, you got a lot of talking to you today. Thanks, Cookie. You're welcome. <laughs> So the capital improvement plan, this is um, the capital improvement plan is the 12 to 20 draft. 
which um, the spreadsheet, or I should say the workbook for this has multiple pages as, as this capital improvement plan evolves over time. Um, as Cookie said from finance and facilities, um, Corrado and I have spent quite a bit of time going through this and um, you know he, he's the one that is prioritizing what we need to do at this point. So um, he did get a lot of pricing on the skylights, which we've talked about before. And in River School, they're all original to the building. So we would do um, the first section um, this coming summer, along with the um, Indian River School thermostat and valve replacement. I think you probably heard him or somebody else mention that some of those thermostats are held together with paper clips and rubber bands. So. Um, there's a lot of aesthetics to this, as well as making sure that, um, you know, the thermostats are part of the Metasys um, facilities management software that um, oversees all the buildings, heating and cooling. Um, the other um, things that we need to do that he's come up with are the um, condenser and evaporators for the kitchens at each of the school. As you probably remember, we, um, we had to do the um, Enfield Village School one this year. So we're trying to be proactive and do these before they fail. So um, he wants to do, well, actually not this year, but the next couple of years. Um, the sewer line replacement is not really a sewer line replacement. It's, um, he described it at facilities, finance and facilities. And it's really like this, this kind of sleeve that you put into the sewer line and it expands and it, um, so you don't have to replace your sewer lines. Um, and it's, it's good, it'll last for 10 to 15 years is what he says. So this old sewer lines underneath the high school were not replaced during the renovation and addition project. So he wants to do one section of that um, this coming summer. And then Indian River School parking lot paving is going to be um, a long-term project, but he has the areas over towards the far end of the parking lot where people park anyway, but that really needs to be paved over by the dumpster and the sheds. So those are the projects he wants to do this year. So um, what I did with this capital improvement plan this year was I reduced the amount going into the capital reserve each year um, down to 75,000 so that you can see the balance after each year is is lower than it has been in, in the past few years. And I was trying to take into consideration um, some of the towns that feel that we're, we're hoarding this money. So this is, um, the intent is to spend the money on the projects we need to spend it on, but not to have a huge balance in this um, capital reserve fund, if that makes sense to you. Does anybody have any other questions? So as you can see at the bottom where it says uh, facilities capital reserve balance, I mean, it really gets down, you know, to uh, under 40,000, which is kind of scary if you think about it. Um, but as we progress into this plan, we can always change that Warren article, you know, to back to, you know, the 100,000 if we feel it's necessary. Mm -hmm. But um, as it stands yeah. right this now, is, yeah, it's yeah. a fluid document, like you said, it, it moves it, all the time. It is a fluid document. And, you know, it really, it, it will probably change again before we get into the summer. I mean, these summer projects, I think, are pretty set. But, you know, as, as facilities go, come and go, I guess. Um, some of these projects may come in sooner and others pushed out further. Um, I did want to mention that the major systems capital reserve has 75,800. And that's another reason that we can keep this balance in here a little bit lower because if, if we had a major system going to go down, um, like the well at the high school, which was the project that we did most recently is connect the high school to the Indian River School well. And we do have this other capital reserve that we can use for that type of project. Okay. So I am anticipating a motion to accept the plan for tonight. I'll make a motion that we accept the capital improvement plan as presented. I'll second. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay. Any further discussion on this capital improvement plan? 
I just wanted to add a thank you in there for um, putting the balances in. I think members of the public have had uh, inquiries to the balances and I know that it will be appreciated. So thanks a lot, Deb. Yeah, many thanks to Deb and Prado for working on this. Um, yeah, like Kelly said on the balances, uh, you know, the higher balances are at the end, and I fully anticipate, uh, you know, different projects by the time we get to, you know, fiscal year 26, 27, 28, um, exactly. where I don't anticipate those balances being that high. Right. So, and as, if they are filed on our, our warrant request, so. As, as Hope said, um, you know, Corrado, once he gets his his feet under him, he'll know exactly what projects we need to do seven, eight, nine, and 10 years out. So I anticipate that you're right, Jim. Okay, is there anything further? Okay, all right, so we have a motion to accept the capital improvement plan as presented. I'll do a roll call vote. And that'll be Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Hope Stragnell. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Danielle Thompson. Yes. Brewster Gove. Brewster. Yes. Yes, go ahead. And Cookie Hebert, yes. So it passes unanimously. Thank you for all your hard work, Deb. And as usual, thank Corrado, please. Okay. Oh, we have some policies. Corrado well, knows what he's doing. He already, he's really good. If you've gone to the finance facility meeting, you ought to hear what he tells us. So he's, he's on top of stuff already. Yes. It, it, it scared me though, when he asked me if I was a baker, because I did not know where that conversation was going about the sewer pipe. <laughs> well, he was describing what this thing does and it's, it's a liner. It lines the inside of the pipe and he's, you know, when you put that stuff in, he says, and you squeeze it out of the tube and I'm like, oh no, where is this going? But so he's very enlightening when he does his descriptive um, conversation. So, <laughs> okay. So second reading on one, two, three. We have four po policies. Let me double check. Oh, never mind. I didn't change the page. Thank you. Thank you I have a question. Yes, Brewster. I'm sorry to ask you about all these policies, but I, I don't know which. I tried picking out which ones they, these were. These policies. Why some of these policies got brought back up again when they've been they've been already been uh we had them like maybe five six years ago i don't I, I can't pick out which ones they are but there's about five or six in this packet we just went, we just had reviewed I, I want to know why we're doing these again sure i'm, I'm happy to answer that so um much to my dismay we tend to approve policies and then the New Hampshire School Board Association, a law may change or something may get updated and the New Hampshire School Board Association updates the policies. Um, you are going to see that we just recently got the fall of 2020 uh, policy updates. And there are at least, there is at least one, there potentially are two policies that we just approved that will be reapproved again. Um, I know off the top of my head, that the uh, head lice and particulosis policy, we just did that policy um, in a very timely manner. The school board association realized that their version was not updated to the current school nursing association standard. So they have then redone it. So you are looking at the particulosis policy. I just like to say that word. You are looking at that policy again. So, um, unfortunately, Brewster, we are keeping up as fast as we can, but the laws are changing and the school board association has been very diligent in making sure that they are updating their policies in accordance with the changes to the law. Um, I'll make a motion uh, to approve for second reading and adoption policy DK payments, checks and manifest policy DGA authorized signatures policy DGA-R school, school student activity account procedures, policy DIH fraud prevention and fiscal management, policy EHAC electronic digital records and signatures, policy JLCF 
wellness policy a b philosophy of the school district policy i h c d slash l e b advanced coursework advanced placement courses and stem dual and concurrent enrollment program and policy i k f g career readiness pathways and credentials all for second reading and adoption and i'll second Okay, Danielle Thompson for the motion, Kathleen Stacy for the second. Any discussion? Okay, seeing none, roll call vote in favor of the motion. Okay, Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Hope Strike now. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Danielle Thompson. Yes. Bruce Tagove. Yes. And yes. Cookie Hebert, yes. So that's a unanimous on the first batch for second reading. We have two policies that will now be rescinded because those policies have been now adopted. Uh, the first one being policy A B A D B, philosophy of special education and education of students with disabilities. This will be rescinded because we adopted policy A D. And the next one will be policy A D dash E, curriculum priorities, rescind with the adoption of policy A D as well. Do I have a motion? I'll make a motion that we rescind policy A, D, B, philosophy of special education and education for students of, with disabilities, and rescind policy A, D, dash E, curriculum priorities. No second. All right, Kathleen, thank you. Thank you, Tim. Any discussion? Okay. Roll call vote. Kathleen Stacey? Yes. Hope you strike now. Yes. Bridget Labrie? Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Daniel Thompson. Yes. Bruce Gove. Yes. Yes. Cookie Hebert. Yes. And they are rescinded. The next batch will be our first reading policies. I don't know if someone would like to read them all or I can or however you want to do this. Oh, go for it. I know. Uh, we'll take <laughs> Go for it. All right. I will make a motion for first reading. Policy LDA, student teaching and internships. Policy JLCG, exclusion of students who present a hazard. Policy JLCC, head lice and pediculosis. Policy EBCG, communicable and infectious diseases. Policy EBCF, pandemic and epidemic emergencies. Policy GBGA, staff health. Policy IHAM, Health Education and Exemption from Instruction. Policy JLCB, Immunizations of Students. Policy JLC, Student Health Services and School Nurses. Policy EBBC slash JLCE, Emergency Care and First Aid. Policy EBBB, Accident Reports, Policy JLCD, Administering Medication to Students, Policy JLCD-R, Procedures for Administering Medication to Students, Policy JLCD-F1, Medication Administration Authorization Form, Policy JLCD-F2, EpiPen Medication Administration Form, self-administered. Policy JLCD-F3, Inhaled Medication Administration Form, self-administered. For first reading. Do I have a second? Oh, okay. second. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Danielle Thompson for the second. <laughs> okay, any discussion on any of these? Any questions? Is there anything from Amanda um, that we should know about any of these policies and the changes? Sure. So you can notice that we've lumped a lot of medically related policies together in this grouping. Um, so here's a huge update. As I said before, the head lice pediculosis um, one is recently updated uh, to put it in alignment with the School Nursing Association's um, recommendations for how students that may have head lice are then treated. 
so that you are seeing that one again. Um, the committee that reviewed these, we did make a couple of added suggestions. So for the most part, you are seeing the new updated New Hampshire School Board Association policies to put them in alignment with medical recommendations. However, on EBCG, it was the suggestion of the committee that on page one under students that we add in the sentence, the last sentence in that paragraph that states remote instruction can be used to participate if students um, is un if a student is unable to attend class in person. I'd like an A in there. Um, and also on the second page, um, the last uh, sentence there um, on the, the top paragraph, that very ending paragraph that says, if employees have a communicable disease that requires quarantine, quarantining, but the employee is physically able to work, remote access may be granted in accordance with all labor agreements and permission of the building principal. So a couple of little mascoma tweaks, if you will, um, but for the most part, we're in alignment. This does put us into align with, alignment with medical rules, regulations, and RSAs. Thank you, Amanda. Anything I have, help? One yep. question on JLCD. Um, it refers to, um, uh, I believe it's the uh, EpiPens and the asthma inhalers. Um, and in the legal reference section, it refers to an RSA that has to do with glucagon for kids being able, you know, being able to administer glucagon. So uh, but there's no reference to the glucagon in terms of um, having it done. So, I mean, it, so I, I, I kind of just noticed, I do have a type one diabetic. So I, I just noticed a little bit of a, you know, very asthma, uh, uh, an EpiPen, but the, the, you know, for the type one diabetics having that on hand and, you know, the glucagon pen is just a, it's no difference than an EpiPen for a diabetic, so. And it is, it is referenced in their legal RSA thing. So I was surprised to not see it. Yeah, I can look hoping we can make sure to add that in. Um, that was JLCD, correct? Yes. Yeah, so the um, glucagon. Yep, we can add that in. Kathleen? So I have a question regarding JLCD-F1. It's the administration authorization form. Um, has there been a legal review of this form? Yes, there has. And that would be by um, the New Hampshire School Board Association. Okay, because I just didn't see a reference on it there. Okay. Uh, I have one more question. Danielle, yeah. Um, in regards to policy JLCB immunization of students, I know that we have talked about uh, looking at sample policy from uh, from the Claremont area related to lead screenings. Um, is that something that we want to? Do we want to have that conversation? Um, as it relates to JLCB, or would that be an additional policy and we can move forward with JLCB as is right now? Uh, so I can tell you that um, in Claremont, I do believe there is a separate school board policy that addresses uh, lead testing or the testing for lead uh, presence in students. So, I mean, we could look at in wellness as we start to explore that more, we can explore whether or not it would be a separate policy for us, or if we would like to incorporate it here. I think either would be valid, but I think for right now, if we put this, um, because this is tied directly into some of our other policies, so I would ask the board that we move forward with this one now, but keeping in mind that we may add to it and amend it later, or we may just add a new policy at a different time. Thank you, Danielle, for noticing. Yeah, okay, that sounds fine with me. Okay, all right, thank you. Anything further on these policies for first reading? Okay. And seeing none, we'll do another roll call vote. Kathleen Stacey. Yes. Hope Strag now. Yes. Bridget Libri. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. 
Daniel Thompson. Yes. Brewster Gove. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Cookie Hebert. Yes, he passes unanimously. Thank you for bearing with us. <laughs> okay, agenda items for the next meeting. Um, Did we need to have the conversation of whether or not we are when the next meeting is? Yes. If we do not meet on the 22nd and we have to approve that other article nine, that means approval of that wouldn't be done until the 12th, which is the day before the public hearing. It doesn't make a difference. No. So uh, what is the pleasure of the board? I mean, historically, we do not meet the second meeting of December. We've always had it on the calendar, but we've always just, just, just made it go away because it's just during the break. Yep. I, I've, I've been... I was just going to say, if we have some pressing business, I'll keep the date free on my calendar. Um, but do we need a motion then? I would, I'll make a motion that we uh, cancel our December 22nd meeting. Second it. I got that one in. Okay, hold on a second. Motion to get. Okay. And that was by Tim Josephson and seconded by Brewster Gove. Came in under the wire. <laughs> okay, discussion. Any other board member? Bridget and Ethan? Um, Kathleen? I mean, in history, yeah, we haven't had it. It's not technically during a break. So I guess if something comes up, then we need to meet. But if there's no pressing business, then I'm fine with postponing. Okay. I get my sleigh ready to go. So I got, I got, I'll be busy. I got my sleigh is getting ready to go. You got to find the reindeer first. I don't need, I got a whole set of reindeer. I'm all set. <laughs> oh my goodness. Okay. So He's the motion on the, on the beard. Hey. He's working on the Santa beard. Motion on the table is to cancel the December 22nd, 2020 school board meeting. If the need arises, uh, all board members are in agreement that we would be able to meet if we had to, correct? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so I'll do a roll call vote for that motion. Sure. Oh, Bridget, did you? Oh, never mind. I thought Bridget was saying something. <laughs> okay. So Kathleen Stacey? Yes. Hope Strag now? Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Jeez, Daniel Thompson. Yes. Bruce DeGolf. I'm going to make this fun. Yes. Why not? I'll get my Santa's hat out. <laughs> Cookie Hebert. Yes. So it passes the two animus. All right. Agenda items for the next meeting, which would now be technically January the 12th. Uh, if we can get Barrett, Christina, on that night, yeah. that would be really good. Yep. So I think, and we'll just have regular committee ports and and whatever else we need. So uh, anything else, you can just send me an email, and we can try and figure it out. And <laughs> the nights become longer. <laughs> okay. Um, I guess now we go to public comments. Uh, we have no one here in the auditorium, so let me bring up. Um, let's see what we got. Oops. Um, if you click on participants. Yeah, I, I got it. Not, yeah, I just say if anyone wants to, there you go, the raise hand function. Yeah, yeah I don't see any hand raising. Hold on. There are two. Lynn Ford. Where is she? Lynn Ford. Go ahead, Lynn. Good evening. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. First, I would like to say thank you to everybody in the district that's working so hard to keep our kids in school and keep them safe and just all the work that's going into it. It's very much appreciated. Um, 
I know that you go, you voted on it earlier to do the remote for the 21st and the 22nd um, as a working parent. Um, I don't know if further consideration could be given to just giving the students the days off instead of doing remote. And this is just my personal preference. Um, you know, it, whatever decision you guys make is whatever decision you make. Um, but the argument is that it's, sorry, I'm trying to form my thoughts. Um, the argument is on my side that for those working, for me personally, it's, I, I have ability to work from home. It's not a big deal, but there are working parents in the district that have either two working parents that are still working full time and they need to find daycare for their children, plus also finding daycare that's willing to do the remote learning, or they might have to take time off and they might not have PTO left over for the rest of the year because they have to take the rest of the, the Christmas break off. Um, I think it's just something that maybe might be a little less stressful for parents if it's possible to do no school those two days and just extend the Christmas break. I'm not sure how that impacts the end of the year. I understand that that's a consideration as well. Um, and again, whatever the board decides is what the board decides. I'm on board with it. I just, as a parent, it might be something to consider for further discussion if that's a possibility. As for the two days on the other end for remote learning, um, that's in January. A lot of PTO plans reset and everything. And there's plenty of time, I think, for parents to be able to get those days off or work remote or whatever. Um, I'm just thinking, you know, if the whole idea is to, to make it less stressful for everybody involved, it might just be less stressful for those parents to be able to just be, I need somebody to watch my kids. Don't worry about the remote learning. So that's, and again, thank you to everybody for everything you're doing. It is much appreciated. Thank you so much, Lynn. Okay, and do I have any other public comment? Yeah, I have my hand up. Okay, yep. Okay, so I have a number of points. So first, I think, you know, there's quite a bit of very privileged discussion here um, where people are like, oh, people can pick up and families can do this and they can do remote, but let's be honest. A major portion of the families the other day when Enfield flipped to remote didn't have the ability to go remote online. And yes, it didn't count in this and that, but for those of us who are serious about education and having our child attend, we didn't have our Chromebooks. Not all of us had adequate access to internet. And it's not okay in a five town district that doesn't have equal access to internet, where I know families were sitting in very kind businesses who offered up their internet to just be like, oh, we're gonna go remote for two days. So you guys voted on that with no input from the public. And I think it's a shame and I think it's unfortunate, and I think it's a terrible ruling to not bother rule on something as a point of order. So to be privileged and to say, oh, it's just going to work out in a town that does not have equal access to technology and the internet is wrong. That's my first point. Um, the, I'd like to go down to another point. Working parents, right? We are a bedroom community of people. We aren't loaded with billionaires and millionaires who don't work and parents who don't work. These are families who have a job. And many jobs here are manufacturing jobs. You can easily look on the census and see what the type of work people do are. Some of them are tradespeople. Certainly our family is manufacturing and trades. Many of us are. Not all of us get the privilege of not going to work. And I think it's very unfortunate to just be like, oh, they're gonna go remote. Remote people are white collar workers. We have many blue collar workers who go to work and they physically work in a location every day. And that does not allow the opportunity for their family to just, oh, take the day off, right? Because that's not how it works. Um, there's not access to laptops, as I said, and there's no dial up. I mean, people have dial up, they don't have high speed. So I think, you know, the normal things that people maybe who are, maybe you guys are very, very lucky and you haven't considered this, but for some of our families, it's a very real problem. My child, who is this kid right here, who you see, Sat in a classroom, I think it's 12 or 13 kids. It's, I don't know if it's, is your child 13 children? No, you tell me which one. Okay, so there are 12 children. Six of the kids in her class made it to class last week. That's not okay, you guys. That's 50%. Because what are you going to do? Of, not a lot of them had, um, not a lot of people, moms and dads have, like, um, a computer. Right. 
So, I mean, you're hearing it from the horse's mouth. I mean, she's not been groomed to do this. This is a child who is honest. And, and in our family, we had an unfortunate accident where our computer just died a horrible death. So we were lucky enough to borrow one. So we went somewhere else. You guys think about it. We went somewhere else. We exposed our child to another household unit to get her into school. So you guys made the choice to force school upon us in a way that was not accessible. So we had to expose ourselves. So I think you have to think about that. I'd like to name another thing. Um, you know, you're talking about things separately outside of COVID that are normal repairs like thermostat. This is probably the third year I've heard the paperclip antidote on thermostat. It's a normal repair that should be in the operating budget. If you have operating funds left this year, do it now. We don't want to hear about it again next year. I want you to fix it. So what we normal towns do and normal businesses do. So those things that need to be aligned within a normal budget just need to get done. Um, let's see. Exits from meetings. I'm seeing some individuals go in and out of meetings. So I hope that your meeting re minutes reflect when your membership leaves a meeting and comes back in re re continuously. So we're seeing in, out, in, out, in, out. And then we're seeing them vote and weigh in on meetings. There goes a person right now. Right? So are you recording the fact that they are leaving the meeting and coming back in or not? I think this is an online meeting, right? It's very important. I understand emergencies happen, right? But you have like one emergency meeting, maybe your house lights on fire, or maybe in my case, you know, all of your dogs decide you're going to bark and you disappear for a hot minute. But you guys need to be talking about that. Um, next point is you guys have made a concession uh, and attribution earlier in the meeting that there were Christmas boxes, I think. I'm going to call them Christmas boxes or December boxes of food. And that those options were offered publicly. I have the email as a parent. They were not offered with any explanation. It was like FOM boxes, essentially. And it really wasn't published in a meaningful way with any links. So some of those communications need to improve. And these are the kind of things you guys like, you don't necessarily see them as day to day. I see them as a parent. So when I see them with my other friends of Mask on my hat on, I'm like, okay, I'm a parent. So I go look at my email and I listen to what you're saying. And I'm like, mm -mm, that's not what it says. Sure. It can go on the announcements and it can get improved, but it's an area where we need to do either a better job linking or a better job communicating. Because if you want these people to have these boxes, you're saying, oh, we're going to shut down for an extra two days. Oh, food's going to be accessible. Oh, this and that. You're not communicating how you're not saying the bus is going to deliver. You're not saying, hey, Kate, because that's me, right? I have a bus stop. It's not used. You asked me not to use it this year. And it's over an hour bus stop. So we won't even do that today. You're not going to deliver food to my child, right? Because it's not a normal stop because you've asked me not to use it. So all of those kind of things, like this is just me as one person. You're not delivering that level of service to other people. So you're like, hey, we're not going to have school. It's great. But you're forgetting all of the nuances of how that. And you maybe talk about it, like, how are we going to cover them? But is it actually happening? Because the other day, it didn't happen for our child. All right. Kate, I, think, Kate, I kind of, we're going to go wrap this up. What's the yeah, next? I have another one. Hub 66 is the internet company that is the fiber optic channel that's coming out here. You guys have a strong interest in fiber optic, I promise you, right? Okay. Um, and bandwidth. And so I've had a conversation with them. I have a call with the CEO tomorrow about um, what we can do. And I think maybe you guys have talked to Fab 66. And if you have not, I'll certainly find out. But they are a great option for getting a more accessible and a much wider band to you guys. Um, and that is my final point. Okay. Thank you so much, Kate. You're welcome. Bye, Carly. Bye. All right. Any other public comment? Wanda? Wanda? No? You're just saying hi? No. I was trying. I'm trying. So, Wanda, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So, first, apologies that you've been stuck with me and you have your faces all the rest of this. That's primarily because I'm not tech savvy and I clicked a button. And so I was then in it to win it with you all. So, um, that was that. So, sorry. But, um, my only point that I'd like to make is, uh, you know, I respect your guys' vote, um, but I do think that it, um, you know, so times have changed, right? So now we all do this on Zoom and lots of it's open very majorly to the public and the public has, looks like, kind of comes into these meetings a little bit more. Um, 
I get the pleasure of um, torturing my children and make them sit in on them and so that they can learn from them, uh, hopefully through their futures. But um, just, just so we're a little bit more privileged in my house. We, I got nine kiddos, um, still five in our district here proudly. Um, so I'm not gonna suffer from them, you know, going remotely before and after. Mine are 100% remote. I choose to do that um, to help our district out as much as I can and my own kids as well. So, but I do think um, I have full faith in Amanda and the system of providing for these students. So I'm hoping that we're well prepared for the ones that we said, hey, tonight we just decided to do this. Um, uh, so I, I have a lot of faith in if it just makes sure, but I would have appreciated po possibly a little bit of a possible thought. Like if you guys know that that's gonna be a subject and it's such a big one for a, a, a big change for anybody in the community to like maybe give them a little bit of open public if you can, maybe just, I realize that you guys stayed within your um, rights and you did it the right way and that's fine. But um, I don't have any issues, of course, it doesn't affect me, but I don't know how many of my friends out there it does affect. So, um, and it looks like we always seem to have a little bit more people on in the beginning of our, of these meetings and, um, and then they just kind of wander off out throughout the meeting. And I hope it's not due to like, well, I never have a say before they even voted anyways um, on something that might've been something very impactful to them. So, um, but then again, with all due respect to all my friends and my families out there with uh, in our district, I have a lot of faith in our district as well um, and the school board and, uh, and the superintendent that those things have been thought of before you actually brought it up um, as a possibility, but just mostly maybe possibly consider beforehand of opening, hey, you know, at this time, we're just gonna, it's not something we typically do, but public comment, maybe just before our board members actually choose so that, I mean, our board members are here to help choose for us, right, in each district. Um, and I think we got a really good team here. So, um, you know, if you're here for us, then you have to make sure that you allow us to have something to say so that at least we know you heard our opinions before you said something primarily on just like a big impactful decision like that. Um, does that make sense? So or understandable, I guess. So again, doesn't affect me, doesn't affect my kids, but I, you know, we all um, need to consider everybody all the way around, especially in our community, because we have a good, district, but we also have a very, um, a very needed group of people that need a lot of different um, help when things change dynamically like that so so fast. I mean, we do have weeks to come before it happens, but um, and so they do have time to prepare. And I imagine Amanda and the uh, school board will have lots of phone calls tomorrow. So um, good luck, guys. <laughs> um, and that's about it. Just just a right. matter like that. Just just maybe consider it ahead of time. Maybe. That's Thank, about you. It. Thank you. Guys. Take care, Wanda. Thank you. Tell the boys to say hello. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh. All right. So uh, next on the agenda, if we don't have anything further for public comment. Okay. Personnel, resignations, and nominations. Um, yes, Cookie, at this time, I do have uh, the nomination of Evan Beals for an IRS basketball coach. He is a renewal, and um, he did coach for us last year, and he will be coming back for this year. That is the only nomination and resignation I have at this time. Okay, any discussion from the board? I'll make a motion so we can talk. I'll make a motion that we accept the nomination as presented. Second. Bridget Labrie for the second. Okay. Discussion? Any discussion at all on the nomination? Okay. Seeing none. Roll call vote. Kathleen Stacey. Yes. Hope Strike now. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Jim Josephson. Yes. Daniel Thompson? Yes. Bruce DeGove? Yes. And yes. Cookie Hebert? Yes. And that passes unanimously. Non public. Do we have any non public for tonight, Amanda? 
Uh, yes, Cookie, we do have non-public in accordance with RSA 91-A colon three, Roman numeral two, for the purpose of subset B, hiring. I'll make a motion that we go to non-public in accordance with RSA 91-A colon three, Roman two, subset B, hiring. First to go for the second. Roll call. Kathleen Stacy. Yes. Hope Stragnow. Yes. Bridget Labrie. Yes. Jim Josephson. Yes. Daniel Thompson. Yes. Bruce DeGove. Yes. Yes. And Cookie Hebert. Yes. So all of those others will be placed in the waiting room. And once we have come out of non public, we will reopen the meeting at that time for the public. All right, Cookie. It looks like everybody's back. Okay. Thank you, Kamala. Okay. Um, so we do have. Staff nominations. I'll entertain a motion for staff nominations as presented. I'll make a motion that we accept the staff nominations as presented and non-public. A second. It's Kathleen Stacy for the second, Tim Josephson for the motion. Okay. Uh, anything further? Okay. Roll call will hope strike now. Yep. Yes. Hello. Bridget Libri. Yes. Tim Josephson. Yes. Danielle Thompson. Yes. Bruce DeGove. They go in there. Yeah. One yes. more time. Yes. <laughs> Kathleen Stacy. Yes. And Cookie Hebert is a yes. So that's seven for the affirmative. Thank you. Okay. Um, I. Nonetheless, there's something else for many of the board members. I will adjourn the meeting at 8.39. I thank you and have a good night. Nice hat. Nice hat, Tim. See ya. <laughs>